Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live on April 4th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. Well, big news happened in Tallahassee yesterday, and we'll continue to watch the state capitol and follow these stories. Yesterday, Governor DeSantis signed permitless carry of firearms into law. So beginning July 1st, you will no longer need training or a permit to carry concealed guns. Also yesterday, the state Senate supported a ban on most abortions in Florida after six weeks. This session, we've also seen big changes to education, and some of those changes are playing out at New College of Florida. So that's going to be our topic this hour. To talk more about New College of Florida, we're joined with a New College professor of anthropology, Maria Vespiri. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe on WMNF, Maria. Hi, Sean, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really glad you could come on. It's such an important story. We have covered a, a new college in the past, in the, in the past few months on this show, of course. Yes. Um, but we'll continue to cover it because it's a really um, interesting and, um, dare I say, scary story that's happening here in New College. And we'll find out more about it this hour. So before we begin, before we talk about things that are happening right now, let's back up a little bit before this year's big shakeup at New College by Governor DeSantis. Are there statistics about the quality of education that New College has provided, especially when it comes to cost compared with private liberal arts colleges around the U.S.? Yes, there are. And um, this is, you know, it's a very nuanced story. I mean, they're the headlines and the culture wars. But behind that, you know, we have offered since 1960 an affordable, within reach of most students, um, honors college education, which is ranked with the top in the nation. Um, we consistently rank among the top five public liberal arts colleges in various um, U.S. News and World Report, um, other sorts of things, uh, assessments. Of course, they all have their own ways of looking at it. But um, the Washington Monthly statistics are pretty interesting. They say that um, close to 40 percent of our students are within 150 percent of the poverty line. Um, yet our students who qualify for Pell Grants graduate at the same rate as everyone else. Um, as a detailed example, um, they have categories, uh, social mobility, research, and promoting public service. Uh, and we rank, you know, way high in all of those. Um, and add to that the fact that the average salary of a new college grad 10 years after graduation is over $100,000. And it's apparent that the college's recognition as a college that changes lives, applies financially as well as intellectually. Uh, one of the things that's happened, unfortunately, is that with the state metrics, they look at primarily, um, you know, your job you get in Florida within a year of graduation. And a lot of our students do take a gap year. They've only belatedly started to account for grad school. We have a very high rate of grad school admission. And um, one thing that I mentioned, I shared with you when I, you know, we were talking about this yesterday is that I got a call yesterday morning from a mother of a prospective student, someone from the Jacksonville area, who's trying to decide if her child should go to new college given all that's happening. And we started talking and she's telling me how much her daughter wants to come and it's just right for her and so on. And then she said, well, you know, the other choices we have are private colleges in the Northeast. And if she ends up going to one of those, we're going to have to mortgage our house. And this is a middle class uh, teacher, a uh, well educated person. So it's not just um, Pell Grant recipients, it's all Floridians who are going to really lose something if new college goes away. So, what I'm hearing is that before the big shakeup that started in January, we're talking about a school that was attractive to students, especially students who wanted a small, small college feel, but at state prices, state state school prices. Uh, so, and and it was academically very fulfilling for students, and it was uh, pr producing students with great opportunities, especially in the medium to long term for job success. And uh, so affordable, successful, and yet there was this gigantic shakeup in January. What happened in the beginning of January uh, with New College of Florida? Well, um, you know, we've had potential shakeups before. Uh, in 2020, uh, the state decided maybe we should be merged with another institution. And um, that didn't work out. In fact, um, the local 
uh, legislative representatives from Sarasota were opposed to that then and said how great New College was, and they're on record as saying that. Now they're saying we're horrible. So, you know, there's been a turnover in that thinking. But um, in Jan January 6th, which is, I guess, a notable day, uh, it was announced that this was going to start happening. It, it caught us really unawares, and it's happened very, very fast. Uh, first, the, the firing of our president um, at the end of January, and then a, a series of events. And I think um, one thing I've shared with people is the most chilling thing about it is the vagueness. I guess we'll talk about uh, House Bill 999 later, but um, the categories that are covered are very vague. So we really don't know, you know what we can teach and what we can't, what programs might or might not be eliminated. It's, it's difficult, but we're trying to carry on. I want to remind people that our guest is New College of Florida Professor of Anthropology, Maria Vespiri. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live on April 4th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And so on January 6th, as you mentioned, Governor DeSantis appointed six conservatives to the new college board of trustees. And it wasn't just maybe an accident that they're just happen they happen to be conservative. Uh, all the press that went along with this, all of everything that Governor DeSantis said made it sound like it was a concerted effort that he wanted to change the makeup of this of this school, change the the atmosphere of it from a small liberal arts college to something that more resembled Hillsdale College, a conservative institution in the north. Uh, so and then you mentioned that the the president of New College of Florida, Patricia Oker, was ousted. And then she, Richard Corcoran, a longtime lawmaker in Florida, and he's he's done other things as well with the state, was instituted as the new president. Tell us about Patricia Oker's time at New College. Somebody who gets kicked out as a college president, you, you might think, wow, they must have done a really terrible job of running that school. But what's your what are your thoughts on her from the inside? Uh, I think there's pretty broad consensus that she was doing a very good job. She was only there for a year and a half. Um, and she made a lot of strides. She took the legislature, the irony is she took the legislature very seriously. And she made a lot of steps that some of us found difficult because, you know, as an honors college, we have a, a different structure than most schools. And so um, they were pretty strict about enforcing uh, all kinds of metrics. And we did our best to meet those goals with her urging and her careful explanation of what was needed. And the students liked her. She met with them very frequently. She was very open. And um, in our school paper, uh, we have um, a series of letters to her that students wrote after she left. Um, there's a lot of sadness about that. And it was, it was very abrupt and it seemed to be, um, well, there's controversy now and I'm not really up on the legality of this, but uh, Corcoran's um, appointment was leaked before she was fired. So it's a lot of looking into that as far as the sunshine laws go, but uh, we do miss her. She was doing a good job. It's, it's not an easy fit for a college president because um, you know we have narrative evaluations rather than grades. We are very proud of our shared governance system. So every detail of hiring, um, evaluation of faculty courses and so on is very carefully discussed and vetted. And that could be, you know, challenging, but she jumped right in and she, I think she was doing a great job and I know I'm not alone. So she, you say she was doing a great job and then she was fired in, in late January from, by these, these new board of trustees members. What do you, what's your take on the board of trustees, the new ones, especially the new trustees and their, their views of women? Have they said anything that gives you an indication that it wasn't just President Oker that, that was a target of theirs, but maybe that they have an issue with women in general? Um, well, the new trustees as a group are, are very conservative. They're, they're proud of that. Um, I would say they're more than conservative. I have some respect for the name conservative. I think they're to the right of that. Um, and um, they've said some pretty explicit things. Christopher Rufo, who's the most outspoken, and he's a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and has them behind him, um, said that we'd all be gone in 120 days. And a new, he said that right away. And a new group would be in. I, I think they might be finding some legal difficulties with that, although I don't know if HB 999 passes. Um, how that'll turn out. Um, both he and a couple of the other trustees have published things um, that are pretty anti-woman from my understanding. Uh, for example, um, uh, 
uh, Rufo uh, has a sub stack and he put a piece in there that uh, was about one of his fellow, uh, fellow uh, Manhattan Institute um, friends, uh, associates, colleagues, which uh, talked about a new book that um, sh she has, Heather McDonald. Um, and she's talking about um, the great feminization of the American university. That's the name of the book. And it's, it's filled with, well, I don't wanna go into the details of it and we don't have time, but it basically is suggesting that um, the fact that so many university leaders are women today um, suggests that there's a change in the culture of universities and it's more um, touchy feely, I guess you'd say. Uh, and, and some of it, and it goes on to say that um, there's psychological, clinical psychological ramifications of this. It's quite insulting to women. And um, that's not alone. And I have to say, some of it reminds me of the Moynihan report that came out in the 1960s about um, something that uh, Senator Moynihan called a quote, tangle of pathology among black families. And he tried to talk about how um, the real problem with um, African Americans was uh, psychological pathology caused by single mothers. And that's you know well documented and it caused a great pushback. And I hope this does too, because I think what's happening is um, a new culture of kind of blaming women for, for what's going on. Our guest is New College of Florida Professor of Anthropology, Maria Vespiri. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And this is coming to you from WMNF in Tampa. We also broadcast to Sarasota, where New College is, and to St. Petersburg, and to Lakeland and Clearwater, and across the world. You could be listening on WMNF.org or maybe on the WMNF community app, community radio app. So um, I want to get to the phone lines pretty soon because I have a caller who says they're a, a new college grad, and I want to hear from Mike in Clearwater in just a minute. Let me let me uh, finish this line of questioning about the firing of the former pr president of New College of Florida, and then when Richard Corcoran is hired, what can you say about his salary? What was his salary or is, and how does that compare to the former president's? Well, there's been a lot written about that, and I think it's um, for the average taxpayer or person out there the most shocking thing of all. Um, his base salary is six hundred ninety-nine thousand um, dollars. Patricia Aukers was something like three hundred and four. I'm not sure the exact figure. Oh, so it's more than double. And um, there's also com been comparisons to, um, you know, given the size of the university. So if we average it out, at one figure I heard was that. The U University of Florida president is basically earning $24 per student, and the new new college president is earning more than $1,000 per student. We only have 700 students. Um, and then there are other perks that go with this, uh, housing, $84,000, um, retirement benefits, and so on. And what's uh, particularly upsetting, and this is in the news very recently and has been, is where this money is coming from. Um, whether the New College Foundation can, can pay for this. Uh, that's a sad story. Uh, people have withheld um, now $29 million of promised contributions to the foundation because this was good faith money that uh, community members uh, donated to support the school as it was. And they're certainly not happy about that. I think the trustees have made it clear they have other sources of funding, so maybe they don't care about that anymore. I really don't know. but. Um, it's um it's certainly worrisome. Um, at the same time, uh, the the foundation leaders have retired rather quickly, and uh, a new person was appointed, um, who is uh, the wife of uh, a legislator Sydney Gr Gruders. Um, oh, she talked aid for a Saras two Sarasota congressmen, um, and she's married to State Senator uh, Joe Gruders from Sarasota. So there's kind of a feeling that something's going on behind the scenes. We don't really know what it is. How would the new, what does the new college foundation do? What does it fund? And if there is some sort of hit to it, whether it's because donors who are unhappy about the direction of the school are withholding funds or because they're having to cover more of the salary of the president or because of leadership um, changes that are happening. If that, that new college foundation does uh, take a hit somehow, what would that impact? 
Well, the New College Foundation, you know, New College was originally a private school and um, the New College Foundation was established to, to run it, I guess. So when it became um, under the uh, auspices or the umbrella of University of South Florida in the 1970s, um, the foundation remained as an independent entity that helped to support um, capital construction of various kinds, um, endowed professorships, summer funding for faculty uh, so that we could have money to do research in the summer. Because even though we're small, we, you know, we don't, we're not just a teacher's college. I mean, we put a strong equal um, stress on scholarship and, and I'm very proud of my colleagues. We're all very active scholars. So that gave us money for that. Student travel. Um, I asked for some figures about that. And um, we uh, do give quite a bit of money to, um, okay. Uh, I'd say one thing that I have here says uh, total support per semester of approximately $25,000 uh, from the, um, the combination of the foundation and the alumni association. That's in turmoil also, and most of the alums have withdrawn from that and are starting their own independent foundation. They do have a GoFundMe, uh, which has raised um, some, I don't know, a lot of money. Um, and uh, they're using that for various things to try to help uh, with different initiatives at the school. Uh, it, it gives out um, 20 to 25 awards per semester to students. It's called the uh, Student Research and Travel Grants. Uh, we don't know if that will be continued or not, um, but it's it's really important because our students travel to a lot of different places. My anthropology students obviously do, but many students do, and it helps them with uh, their really great number of uh, Fulbrights and other kind of fellowships that they get. Uh, so it, we're worried like about it. Yeah, that's the importance of the New College Foundation. And we're speaking with a professor of anthropology at New College of Florida, Maria Vespiri. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and this is WMNF Tampa. Let's take a phone call here from a New College graduate. Hi, Mike in Clearwater. You're on the air. What would you like to say? Well, first of all, I'm not a New College graduate. My daughter is. I encouraged her to transfer there from UF in 2002. And she ended up graduating from New College at that, at, I think, in 2004. And uh, due to the fine education she got there, she was able to secure a position at DePaul Law and earned a year of scholarship directly due to the writing that they had her do at New College. I mean, New College has always been a jewel of education in this area for students like my daughter that maybe would didn't fit into the traditional large school setting and the fact that again the republican legislature has taken that away basically hopefully not hopefully can fight for this uh it's just terrible i mean it's like uh, you know they, their goal the legislature's goal is to eliminate public schools and to eliminate anything that doesn't fit into their cookie cutter idea of education. And I just want people out there to know what a valuable asset this is to our community. You, you know, I, I talked it up to other parents who maybe their kid doesn't fit into quite the traditional large school university football team type of uh, setting. But, it, you know, it's always been a school where it's like bang for your buck. I think it made U.S. News back then, and it was a big deal about my daughter's very successful up there, and she's actually also a member of an alumni group up in Chicago, and there's some, you know, pretty successful people that went to New College and ended up successful all over our country. So I just wanted to echo my support for that school, and, uh, you know, if there's any, like, the GoFundMe page, I kind of heard that, so I'll pass that along to my daughter. Well, Mike, thanks so much for that that uh, perspective, and we appreciate that information. So thank you for that. And if anyone else has some firsthand or secondhand accounts of New College of Florida, and you'd like to call in 813-239-9663. We're taking calls live here on April 4th. And you can also email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. If you text or email, why don't you say what your name is so that we know how to refer to you? 
and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and our guest is Maria Vespiri, who is with New College of Florida. She's a professor of anthropology. And uh, so any thoughts, Maria, on what we heard there from, uh, from, uh, Mike. from Mike in Clearwater? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Mike. That's really helpful. And we've had a lot of support from parents uh, who are very, you know, I mean, they understand what's happening. Um, I went to an honors program myself. I, I'm a graduate of University of Massachusetts Amherst as an undergrad. I was in the honors college there. I'm a Commonwealth scholar. Um, that allowed me to go on to get a fellowship to a really good grad school. And I'm a real believer in this kind of education. It's not for everyone. It's for high achieving students. New college is hard. My students are reading graduate level work. And when they go to grad school, they often write back and say, oh, I read this already, you know. Um, so uh, we really, that's been our emphasis. And when the state has, you know, really said, well, you need to get a job in Florida within the year, that doesn't always match up. I mean, yes, we do try to prepare students for real world situations. And many of them do get jobs right out of called many of my graduate my many of my journalism students because I teach journalism too um, check out the ncfcatalyst.com if you want to hear what's going learn what's going on um, many of them have gotten really good jobs one's at the New York Times right now one's at NPR they're at a lot of different and that's or they've gone to grad school and been competed for for grad school the one who went to NPR um, got a full fellowship to University of Missouri journalism program for grad school the one who was at the New York Times uh, was competed for by Columbia and Chapel Hill. Full fellowship went to Chapel Hill. So, and this is in the last recent years. Uh, some of the talk has been that New College used to be great, but now it isn't. That's not true. Um, we're still great today. Maria Vesperi is a professor of anthropology and journalism at New College of Florida. And this is Tuesday Cafe, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. Let's. We were talking a moment ago about the transition between presidents when one president was fired, and before that, it was leaked that it, it, the, the new president, I should say, the new president would be Richard Corcoran, a highly connected, a well-connected political uh, person in the state of Florida, uh, and so. Um, we recently got text messages that suggested that new College of Florida trustee Matthew Spaulding coordinated efforts behind the scenes to overhaul the college's leadership. And that was reported in, I think it was the Bradenton Herald or the Sarasota Herald Tribune. Our reporter, Talia Van Sistine, is going to, is going to uh, tell me which one in just a second, because we're going to play a, a story from her, a short story. She says that alumni says that the news raises legal and ethical concerns. So we'll hear this story from Talia Van Sistine, and then we'll be right back with Maria Vespiri. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. According to the Sarasota Herald Tribune, Spalding texted several individuals to plan the motions he made during a board of trustees meeting on January 31st. These motions included moving towards hiring Richard Corcoran as interim president and Bill Galvano as general counsel for New College's board. Governor Ron DeSantis also appointed six new members to the institution's board of trustees on January 6th, just weeks before Spalding's motions. Many New College alumni have expressed frustration and worry over these changes to the board. Some have formed groups to fight for the preservation of the college's founding principles, including a new nonprofit called the Novo Collegian Alliance. Bill Rosenberg is a new college alum and a member of the board of directors for the Novo Collegian Alliance. He says Spalding's text messages indicate that the board isn't following Florida sunshine laws. Rosenberg and other concerned alumni are lobbying to senators who will review the Board of Trustees appointments in hopes they will oppose them. These trustees are not qualified for the offices they've been appointed to. Uh, there was no vetting. They were foisted upon the, the existing board and the existing president with no consultation at all with the new college community. It simply happened. As of Thursday evening, New College of Florida had not responded to an emailed request for comment. For WMNF News, I'm Talia Van Sistine. Well, thanks, Talia, for that report. And I'll turn back to our guest, Maria Vespiri from New College of Florida, professor of anthropology. Your thoughts on these text messages. And also, I'll ask you about the review of the trustees by the Senate. I believe that's taking place this week. 
Um, well, uh, you know, there's a lot of intrigue around this. We don't really know. I know that there's been some requests for uh, to subpoena Christopher Rufo's um, email, I mean, uh, cell phone logs and other things. Um, it's it's interim, you know, uh, Corcoran is the interim president. And when we when he was asked in one of the meetings, um, I believe by uh, Grace Keenan, our uh, head of our student government, who's a trustee, uh, what about any kind of search or like that? The answer is, well, he's interim and you don't have a search for an interim person. So we don't know what the long-term situation is there. Um, between his taking the position on March 1st and the firing of uh, President Corcoran on January 31st, there was an interim person stepped in, um, Brad Thiessen, who's now uh, interim provost because the provost stepped down very recently. Um, and um, you know he is a person who is from New College. He is doing his best to keep the ship afloat. Uh, he's the one who knows what's going on. So um, he's been willing to step into these roles as interim. And um, I commend him for that because uh, I don't believe that the people taking over really understand how the school operates. And so that's been really good. Um, our, our guest is Maria Vespiri, a New College of Florida professor. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from WMNF in Tampa. And over the weekend, New College hosted a conference called Academic Freedom in the Sunshine. And we're going to hear a little bit from that conference in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, let's maybe first hear a few minutes from the keynote speech. This is by Jeremy Young with Penn America talking about academic freedom. So let's hear a little bit of this and we'll be back in just a minute or two, a few minutes with Maria Vespiri from New College of Florida. Again, you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm here to talk to you today about academic freedom in the sunshine. And after spending this morning uh, getting a tour uh, of your beautiful campus, I can tell you that New College definitely still has one of those things. Seriously, it's wonderful to be here taking advantage of the academic freedom and free expression that this campus has always been known for. I can't think of a place I'd rather be to talk about the importance of free speech on campus than right here on the front lines of the fight for free colleges and universities in our free society. And I commend President Corcoran and the Board of Trustees for allowing this conversation to happen here on the new college campus. In fact, I was hoping one of your trustees, my old friend Chris Rufo, uh, would be here today to witness this inspiring academic conversation about academic freedom uh, that we've just heard, uh, particularly this last panel. Uh, but reading through Chris's Twitter account, I learned that he's spending this month in Budapest with his other friend, a higher ed strategist who helped Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban ban a university back in 2017. So while I'm sure Chris is having stimulating conversations about academic freedom, just as we are, I think he might benefit a little more from the conversation here in this room. Uh, like Chris, and like most of New College's other new trustees, I'm not from around here, or even from Florida, or a neighboring state. Although I should mention that uh, Penn America's, uh, three of Penn America's trustees do live in Florida, which means we have almost as many trustees from Florida as you do. Here's another thing I have in common with your new trustees. Uh, I believe that the best way to truly understand the character of a college is to find out what Republican politicians think about it. So I checked, and here's what I found. Let me read you a few quotes. Here's the first one. New college is academic rigor with freedom and diversity of thought. Very rigorous studies, but students structure their course of study with their academic advisor, with a professor, and diversity of thought. Ever since I was student government president there, it's characterized new college. I think respect for diversity of thought is more important now than ever. Anyone know who said that? That is former Republican Congressman Lincoln Diaz Balart, new college class of 1975 speaking in 2021, just two years ago. Here's another one. New College has a very special national reputation and we just don't want to have it flushed down the toilet. I'm very uncomfortable about someone from another part of the state telling us what we need to do in our backyard. They're going to have a hell of a fight on their hands. 
That one, anyone? Burn Buchanan, current Republican congressman, in 2020, defending New College against an attempt by the state to merge it into Florida State University. All right, here's one more. Florida's only honors college, New College of Florida, is a beacon of shining success as an independent collegiate institution in Sarasota. It has been ranked at or near the top of college listings nationwide on multiple measurements from academic achievement to value to Fulbright fellowships and many more. Since it became an independent institution in 2001, the achievements gained by New College have been staggering. It is clear that the per student value is considerably higher than the rest of the state's institutions of higher learning. That one, anyone? Joe Gruders, former Florida Republican Party chair, also in 2020. Okay, look. I understand New College isn't for everyone, an environment of rigorous academics and individualized study where students feel welcomed and challenged at the same time, where they have a hand in shaping their own course of study, where they get one-on-one -on -one attention from their professors in small classes that are, would otherwise only be available to rich kids at elite private schools. That doesn't have universal appeal. It's not what everyone wants. I get it. But still, Reading those comments from three of this region's most prominent political leaders, all Republicans, praising New College and its identity just in the last three years, I have to ask you all, what's changed? Did New College suddenly become a poor value? Did it drop its unique curriculum when I wasn't looking? Did it switch to 300 student lecture classes? Did it become exclusionary or unwelcoming? Well, at least before January. Uh, because just, uh, just three years ago, there was bipartisan agreement that this school was special and that its unique mission ought to be preserved. Now, the state has handed it over to a group of out-of-state political operatives with the mandate, as the governor put it, to make New College a Hillsdale of the South. Clearly, someone in Tallahassee is paying less attention to what local Republican politicians think about New College than I am. For his part, uh, Chris, my friend Chris, says that New College, in his words, has a culture problem. And I want to congratulate him. In just two months on the job, Chris has indeed made great personal strides in changing New College's culture. He has made fun of the chosen pronouns of a New College staff member the school had just fired. He has called two professors research pure left-wing Mad Libs and said it's lucky that both are visiting professors because they'd be easier to fire. He has described some new college faculty as bullying and intimidating people. He has attacked, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that was an interesting comment as well. Uh, he, he has attacked parents of new college students, an excellent strategy for attracting and retaining students, by the way, to attack their parents uh, as helicopter parents and coddlers for protesting the board's actions. And he has even mocked a new college student on Twitter for saying she was sad about the takeover of the new college board. I believe Chris was describing the culture he hopes to create here at New College when he tweeted, winning is better than being nice. You know, what's happening at New College is personal for me. As a high school graduate in Arizona, I had heard of New College, believe it or not. I knew of it as a shining light in American higher education, an idyllic place where students could focus on learning, design their own majors, get personal attention from their professors, all for the price of public tuition. While I didn't end up applying to New College, I crossed the country to enroll at another public liberal arts college, St. Mary's College of Maryland. St. Mary's, <laughs> yeah, represent. Uh, say <laughs> St. Mary's uh, was a place where leaders were trained, just like new colleges. One of my classmates is now the mayor of Baltimore. Another is the county executive of Frederick County, Maryland. A third nearly became the mayor of Washington, D.C. That's what happens at a place like that or like this, where you, when you democratize individualized instruction and attention and invest significant resources in helping students learn and lead, even when those students can't afford private school tuition. That's what happens at a place, a college, where you learn that everyone matters, even you, and that every idea matters, even yours. 
Well, that's Jeremy Young. He's with PEN America. He was speaking over the weekend at a conference called Academic Freedom in the Sunshine. It was in Sarasota. And I'm going to put video of that conference uh, of, of that conference on our website, WMNF.org. So beginning this afternoon, you'll be able to watch it if you'd like. And our guest this hour is Maria Vespiri, New College of Florida Professor of Anthropology. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. So Maria, why did you help organize a conference called Academic Freedom in the Sunshine? Why is that needed? Well, we feel that, um, you know, as academics, we have rights and responsibilities. You know, uh, the rights part is, you know, for one kind of discussion, but the responsibilities is what we were really trying to focus on. What are our responsibilities? Um, to do our scholarship in the most credible, thorough, rigorous way possible, and then to share that with our students and to help them learn how to think for themselves, to provide the most current models of scholarship of all kinds so that they can work on this. You know, we have a senior thesis and it, for my class in teaching history of anthropological theory, which I have taught in the past and now um, is being taught by another colleague. Um, but it's um, my main goal there is to show them various theoretical models and have them explore those and kind of handle them like you would a Rubik's cube and say, what works, what doesn't work? What can I use? And um, now it looks like we're being told, you know, theory's out. We can't, we can't talk about theory, and that's really troubling. So the conference brought together um, Jeremy and, of course, uh, uh, who joined uh, joined us in person. He's very dynamic. We've Penn America has reached out to us and been very, very helpful. Um, and also, uh, of course, uh, Andrew Gothard, our uh, head of our union in the state, UFF, and then five professors from around the state, not new college professors, from other institutions, including uh, one from Eckerd, which is a private institution, talking about you know, the effects that this has and what our responsibilities really are and how we can maintain those. And we'll hear from Andrew Gothard in just a minute. I want to introduce HB 999 first. Uh, let me read a couple of the emails that have come in as well. Kurt writes in, as a new college alum, thank you for paying attention to this hostile takeover. So thanks for that information, Kurt. Also, Bubba writes in, I remember Maria did a great book on old school St. Pete called The City of Green Benches. And Bubba goes on to say, it's shameful that DeSantis is ruining new college and th this one comes from uh, from uh, someone you know, Maria. David Bryant writes, thank you so much for bringing Maria on your show today. She was one of my favorite professors when I went to New College. I was curious about whether many college faculty are planning to leave because of this hostile takeover. If I were in their shoes, I would likely move on to another job. Also, many New, new College of Florida students do not stay in Florida. But why? But is that a bad thing? Our alums are spreading their time, talents, and smarts all over the world. So would you like to respond to anything that David or, or anyone else has said there, Maria? Well, I really appreciate those comments. Thank you very much. Um, it, it means the world. Um, but I would say uh, about the other faculty, I can't speak for anybody. We do have a lot of people who are taking leave. You know, we have a, a earned leave program. And um, so some people are taking advantage of that, maybe as a cooling off period to see what's happening. Um, myself, I'm past retirement age. I stay at New College because I love it. So, um, you know, I, I could retire at any time, but I really care about the education there and I really care about the students and the opportunities. I'm still an active scholar. It's wonderful to have a base like this to work from. We'll see what happens. Um, it certainly is disruptive. We have a lot of people taking leave next year. It's disruptive for the programs. Um, one of my students who's a sophomore, we do very close advising, and one of my students who's a sophomore, um, his major, um, there are only going to be like two faculty, and it's an interdisciplinary major for next year. So he is looking at transferring, and some students are, some, you know, we'll see, people are keeping their eyes and ears open, because to return to something I said earlier, vagueness is really the biggest tool that's being used against us right now. We don't know what's going to happen over the summer between our contracts. And so far, we've talked mostly specifics about New College of Florida, but there is this big higher education bill that's moving through the Florida legislature. By all indications, it's uh, it's likely to be successful and be signed into law. So let's talk now about HB 999, 
The companion bill in the Senate is called SB 266. So maybe the best way to introduce this is to have it introduced by the person you mentioned a moment ago, Andrew Gothard, which who is with the university, sorry, with the United Faculty of Florida. What that is, is that's the labor union that represents faculty in Florida. And so um, as part of his, here's part of his speech to that Academic Freedom in the Sunshine Conference Saturday. We're going to join the speech in progress. And he talks about HB 90, 999 and SB 266. And after this, we'll be right back with our guest, Maria Vespiri, who's a New College of Florida professor of anthropology. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe, brought to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Here's, here's Andrew Gothard from the United Faculty of Florida. The moment that we are in, in 2023, is a historic one because all of the things that I've just said are exactly what are on the line when we look at the, the actions by our governor, we look at the actions by our legislature, and all of the rights that these authoritarian individuals would want to take away from us. So let's start by talking about, I think, what is on everyone's minds right now, especially those of us in higher education, HB 999 and its Senate companion, SB 266. What does this bill really do? And as is, as is true with the Florida legislature every year, the bill gets amended, there are committee substitutes, drafts are passed around, things change, unless you're, and God bless you if you don't have to be, <laughs> unless you're plugged into the ridiculousness of the legislature like I and some of my colleagues have to be on a daily basis, you may not be fully up to date on what exactly is happening with HB 999, but let me tell you something. The version of HB 999 that exists right now is worse than the version that existed before the beginning of the legislative session only four weeks ago. Let me tell you what HB 999 wants to do. That bill, if it is passed, will ban majors and minors, not just in the original language that that bill used, not just in critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion, even though, as we all know, there are no major majors and minors specifically in diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, this is what happens when you have people writing legislation who don't know anything about higher ed, but also queer theory. Now the bill has expanded, and it is not just banning majors and minors in those areas, but in a whole array of critical theory, and it bans majors and minors that utilize those theories. So what we're going to be looking at if this bill passes is not just bans in specific areas like queer theory, but we would be looking at bans of English, education, history, criminal justice and criminology, pre-med, pre-law, any of an array of majors and minors across the institution will have to be banned and their faculty will be terminated or all of these majors and all of these faculty will have to practice self-censorship. They will all have to cut readings. They will have to shut down programs in order to evade this ban. And we at the United Faculty of Florida argue strongly that this kind of banning is not just immoral and unethical, but it is illegal. This kind of banning is against Florida statute. It is against the Florida Constitution, and it is against the United States Constitution, and we are gearing up for the fight of our lives to stop this bill if it goes into effect. And that is my promise to you as the president of the United Faculty of Florida. But what else? We jam funding for diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives across the across universities and colleges. And I know that earlier in January, the uh, college presidents in particular put out a ridiculous letter that stated that they were committed to ferreting out all DEI and CRT initiatives at their institutions and banning funding for them. Well, let me say unequivocally, as, an, as the president of an organization that represents faculty across this bank and graduate assistants across this state, that diversity, equity, and inclusion are good for higher education. It is a good thing when we provide more opportunities to students and groups and communities who are marginalized and underrepresented at our institutions. It is a good thing when we are opening doors rather than closing them to our institutions of higher learning. And it is a good thing when we treat everyone equally and we give everyone a fair shot at a degree that will improve their lives, will improve the lives of their family members, and it will help their community. That is good. And anyone who tries to tell you differently is trying to manipulate you. 
that is what we want. So we are strongly against any banning of DEI. And let me tell you something too about funding. All these reports went out, and I'm still pretty mad at the reporters who wrote about this. And I tell them this, actually got into somebody with this about this earlier this week. A lot of the reporting about that, um, the reports that institutions had to submit to the Board of Governors about how much they were spending on DEI programs focused on, oh, this institution is spending this many million, this institution is spending this many millions. Well, what they didn't note is that the total spending of these institutions on DEI was something like 1% or less of their total funding for the year. It's not as if Florida has gone off the deep end with DEI spending. In fact, we're still pretty far short of where we would argue it needs to be. And I guarantee you, it is multiples less than how much the state of Florida is currently spending to defend the unconstitutional, ridiculous laws that they keep passing every legislative session under Governor Ron DeSantis. So if we're talking about where taxpayer money needs to go, I say let's put it in DEI initiatives and let's let the legislature you know, get over themselves and start actually passing legislation that can stand up to public and constitutional scrutiny. What else is in it right now that we now know this terrifying? Well, there's a direct attempt to control the way that our faculty are able to talk about historical events and historical facts. And it, and it happens in two spaces. One is that um, the law bans faculty from distorting historical events. And when asked on the record in committee what that means, how do you define distorting a historical event and who gets to make that decision? The sponsor of the bill couldn't answer and didn't seem particularly interested in trying to understand the complexity of that issue. But I can tell you what, those of us in higher ed know, and we fundamentally believe that the whole role of being being curious, being inquisitive, asking questions is about looking at the way we have understood historical events, gathering up new evidence, and using that to rethink the way that we understand ourselves as a people and as a society. Those are good things. And trying to ban that can only have one purpose. It is to try to force faculty and students to adopt one ideology one way of viewing the world. It is state-sponsored indoctrination, the same kind of action that we are seeing from the Board of Trustees members at New College, like Christopher Rufo and the other extreme partisan appointees that Governor DeSantis has put into place. We have seen time and again that they are not interested in equal access to ideas. They are not interested in academic freedom. They are not interested fundamentally in freedom at all. They are interested in enforcing one way of viewing the world one way of understanding historical events, one way of interpreting facts and data. And that is not what higher education is about. That is not what America is about. It is fundamentally anti-democratic, and we oppose it fully and formally. Well, I'm going to pause that right now. We could go back to it if if we uh, decide to, because uh, Andrew Gothard was making some really good um, kind of a, uh, how the evolution of HB 999 has gone in the state legislature. And it's, I think it's really informative to, for people to know what's happening with that bill. But uh, let's bring our guest back into the conversation. I want to remind people that you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and my guest is from New College of Florida, Professor of Anthropology, Maria Vespiri. You helped organize that conference. Uh, one of the people that was invited was Andrew Gothard, the president of the United Faculty of Florida, the Union for College Professors. He was speaking Saturday at that conference called Academic Freedom in the Sunshine. And I'm going to put that full video up on our website, WMNF.org, later. Later this afternoon. So your thoughts on what some of the things that are that that uh, Andrew Gothard was saying are in HB 999? Well, um, Sean, he said a lot of really valuable things, and I hope people, you know, do take a listen to the to the whole thing. Um, one thing I'd like to just hone in on for a minute, because I think it doesn't get reported that much. He mentioned various other majors that would be affected, and it's largely across the board. I mean, so many. Uh, but he mentioned pre-med, and that might be puzzling to people. But it's it's worth knowing that um, one of our speakers at the Saturday event is um, professor of, well, assistant professor of microbiology and cell science at the University of Florida. And she was talking about its effect on the STEM fields. And several of the people who've been really strong on this are from STEM fields. And the example that she gave a couple of examples, um, she teaches uh, virology. 
And so this creates, you know, discussion about the coronavirus. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that. And so she's concerned that if this bill passes, that would have an effect. She's already struggling with people who say things about the coronavirus that don't add up with science, but would she be able to still talk about that? And that's just one example of the kinds of things that you wouldn't imagine would be, um, you know, but that's at odds with what the governor has had to say about the coronavirus. So uh, if you can't even teach the science, what can you do? One of the things that we found out when the, the bill that's, that the critics call Don't Say Gay passed last year is a, during the debates on the floor of the legislature, on the House and the Senate, the, some of the Democrats who opposed that bill when it was moving through would say, this bill is very vague. I we don't know what's happening, and then and the the Republicans, the supporters would say, "Oh, read the bill. Everything's in the bill that this will do." And it turns out, in retrospect, I think it's fair to say, a year later, in this case, the critics were right. The bill the bill was so vague that all the it just encompassed a whole bunch of things that weren't specifically written in the bill and. Uh, people were nervous about what it might be and it was too vague. And so they didn't know how it was going to play out. What, how would you apply that to HB 999 and the specifics versus whether HB 999 is vague and how that might impact it if it does pass and it takes effect on college campuses? Well, there are very few specifics in it, as I think Andrew was alluding to. Um, you know, the specifics of... Um, Gender studies and queer studies, that's one thing. But, and that is clear, they don't want that. Um, but beyond that, it isn't just uh, fields that are affected by those fields directly. It's, it, it extends to critical theory in general. So theories, I mean, <laughs> theories as I understand them are critical approaches to things. And the way you teach those is to put them up there and say, okay, what works, what doesn't, where does this go? Um, that's critical thinking. That's something that we've always tried to instill in our students. And if we're not able to use the tools we need across many, many fields from you know, microbiology to my field of anthropology to English, you know, with that one, are they gonna be looking at book lists? What have been taught you know, as the classics of uh, literature, both Western literature and international literature, comparative literature, which was one of my areas of study also. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, it does have, it is very vague. And I think it leaves it up to, especially since ordinarily at a university, if somebody does something out of line, seriously out of line, it's reviewed by a series of groups within the school who have all the tools at hand to understand the context, to understand what it means to know that person. This puts it in the hands of, you know, the president of the school and the provost, which in our case are going to be people who really don't know us and, and who, you know, aren't saying what they plan to do. And as a, a last note on HB 999, I'm going to uh, mention that Tampa Bay SDS is going to be protesting against HB 999 on the campus of USF Tampa. It's this coming Thursday at noon at the Bull Fountain there near the Student Center. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for coming on Tuesday Cafe today, Maria. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I didn't answer one of your questions, which had to do with um, the, leg the trustees being reviewed, that is in the legislature now. If you have an opinion on that, time to speak to your representative about it. Well, thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Maria Vespiri is a professor of anthropology at New College of Florida in Sarasota. You can watch this interview on WMNF.org. You can also watch that conference, the Academic Freedom in the Sunshine Conference that happened over the weekend. That'll be on WMNF.org as well. I'll probably get it up by early this afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. I'm News and Public Affairs Director here at WMNF Tampa. We'll be back next Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelley Reback will host Midpoint. Her guests will be psychologists who specialize in counseling Jewish and BIPOC, LGBTQ plus and trans clients. 
Next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. They'll speak with the CEO of the Florida Aquarium, Roger German. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on April 4th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening. And thanks to everyone who contributes at WMNF.org.